When interviewed, most Americans actually share religious beliefs with one another on a frequent level. Um, of an interesting scale, uh, a lot of uh, Christians in the United States uh, do not believe in a hell, actually. Uh, they believe in, in, if they do believe in any sort of divine punishment, they believe in immediate punishment. And that's sort of different from what's being told to us by the media uh, as to what the Christian landscape looks like. In the same way, the Zoroastrian landscape is kind of difficult to pinpoint down because the main emphasis of Zoroastrianism is free will. Uh, so each individual, I joke that if you get a room of Zoroastrians together, 10 of them, you'll get 12 different opinions as to what Zoroastrianism is. Author, translator, and scholar Pablo Vasquez is our guest this time on the Plutopia podcast. We discuss his conversion from Catholicism to Zoroastrianism and its influence upon other religions. Pablo also explains Zoroastrian beliefs and Zoroastrianism in North America. We also explore QAnon as a possible religion. Hey, welcome everybody to the latest episode of the Plutopia podcast. I'm John Lebkowski. I'm here with my partner in crime, Scoop Sweeney. And our guest today is Pablo Vasquez. Pablo, who was born in Panama, but now lives in Texas, uh, not far from us, I think, is a scholar, author, translator, game writer, lecturer, consultant, and essayist. And he's also the author or translator of, of a recent uh, publication of the Sacred Gathas of Zarathustra and the Old Avestan Canon. Uh, did I pronounce those right, Pablo? Oh, you got it. Yeah, <laughs> well done. Oh, cool. And that was uh, through John Hunt Publishing. That looks like kind of an interesting publishing place. Um, and uh, Pablo, you're you're currently working on a, another graduate degree. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. Uh working on my second graduate degree. My first one was in religions of Asia and Africa with a concentration on Zoroastrian studies and also new religious movements. And uh, my second degree right now is I am working on uh, multi-religious theology and comparative theology. Wow, that's impressive. And those are degrees I didn't even know existed. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So how how were you drawn to this multi-religious approach, and and how did you decide to focus specifically on Zoroastrianism? Well, let me see. I was uh, raised in the Caribbean, a fairly multi-religious place. Uh, you know, um, I hear Americans consistently say that this country is, you know, a melting pot, a great mix of cultures, but in reality. I think I experienced that more living in Latin America than I have in the United States, at least in the interchange of ideas and festivals and, you know, celebration and everything like that. Um, and so my own household was multi-religious. Uh, my mother was a uh, Catholic Buddhist is the best way to put it. Um, and my father uh, was a Santero. Uh, so he practiced Santeria. And so, uh, which was not abnormal uh, for a Latin American household, especially in the Caribbean, due to the various trade networks, you had people of varying faiths, cultures, backgrounds, and so forth. Um, so through that, I, I grew up mostly Catholic. I ended up uh, then leaving the church and exploring a variety of different faiths. I uh, found myself uh, falling in love, actually, with studying the different religions of the world um, to where it's become now my academic field, uh, my professional life, mostly. And I would say that I first encountered Zoroastrianism by going to a big interfaith event, uh, one of the largest historically called the Parliament of the World's Religions. Uh, originally founded in Chicago in the late 1800s, it was where folks like Swami Vivekananda introduced Hinduism to the, uh, to the United States and so forth. Um, it still exists, and uh, this one was in Salt Lake City. And uh, the way I grew up learning about Zoroastrianism was it's sort of a, a dead religion, you know, the religion of the Persian Empire and uh, long gone. 
basically. It is kind of shrinking, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It, it's particularly small. I would say less than 200,000 in my best possible estimate is actually less than 120,000. Mm -hmm. um, but I met Zoroastrians there for the first time and I couldn't believe it, <laughs> just mostly because it, it's it's a rare thing. And they were some of the nicest, most engaging people. But something I particularly noticed about them is how exceedingly educated they were per capita. Um, Zoroastrians have a punch historically that far outweighs their numbers. Um, they have produced a great number of businessmen, scientists, academics, and so forth that uh, is astounding. Uh, I recently went to uh, the World Zoroastrian Congress in New York City this year, and uh, out of the sort of almost 1,200 people there, it was fascinating how almost most of them were involved in some advanced field or another. So it, it always very interesting to me, but um, I ended up uh, not just falling in love with Zoroastrianism as an academic focus, but also as a personal faith as well. I view it not just as uh, a sort of uh, religion of the past that I fell in love with, but also I think it holds much of interest even to a, someone who you know would normally not believe in any particular religion because i view it as a religion of the future it's tending to get more and more traction in philosophical discussion circles and i noticed that it's also being discussed in political circles particularly of the uh far left and the far right which i find very fascinating um in other words in at the political extremes exactly exactly mm -hmm. and uh I, I firmly believe that uh, what exists in societal and political extremes can really much, very much tell us uh, where society, where politics, where culture, and where religion is going into the future, uh, mostly because those are the trend makers. Those are the ones that tend to shape uh, public discourse in many ways. Uh, sadly, as we've seen in the United States, of course, a lot of our discourse is shaped by extremism, but uh, most of the times those extremisms are not politically motivated and i'll get into that later but uh zoroastrianism for sure has become a dominating interest and in particular when i was at university at soas university of london uh where i got my degree my first master's degree um i wrote my dissertation on kurdish zoroastrianism which is both uh both of my main fields there zoroastrianism and new religious movements since it is a new revival of Zoroastrianism amongst the Kurds. Yeah. Uh, one historical question. Mm -hmm. I sort of believe, but I don't know specifically, that uh, Zoroastrianism has had a, an influence on other religions. What other religions might it have influenced? Well, I think... And I'm thinking of more well-established religions versus like new religious movements. Of course, of course. And uh, I do think it has had a huge influence on a variety of religions, but probably not as huge as some people like to claim. Um, the common claim I hear consistently is that Zoroastrianism is the secret force behind Judaism and Christianity. Uh, I don't. I don't think that's particularly true. I do think that there was a huge influence on Judaism um, during the Babylonian exile due to the fact that it was Cyrus, very likely as a Russian himself, who uh, ended the Babylonian exile and brought uh, the Jewish community back to the lands of Canaan. And so there was definitely an effort. See, Persian Empire worked uh they had a philosophy of governance which they compared to a garden so uh, our word uh paradise come from uh paradisia which is an old persian word that refers actually to garden uh to a garden and so when uh when folks like Cy cyrus and darius expanded their empire they viewed it as maintaining 
basically a flower bed in a garden every time they conquered a new nation. Uh, so when they conquered Babylon, the classic example that we have from the Cyrus Cylinder, which is attributed to some to have some of the first mentions of human rights and human protections, is that um, they did not impose their own gods. They upraised gods that were previously smashed down by the state uh, to allow them to be worshipped, like Marduk and so forth in Babylon. Uh, with Judaism, I do believe what ended up happening there is there was a similar sort of circumstance, a sort of strengthening of Jewish law and coding of Jewish traditions and law uh, that probably did not exist uh, before this time. Uh, during the time of Ezra, there was very much a sort of uh, building of what we would consider today Judaism, uh, which was later, of course, evolved uh, as time went on. But I think that uh, uh, further, the two religions that ended up having the most influence from Zoroastrianism would actually be Buddhism, uh, because Buddhism uh, almost did not survive historically. Um, it was considered a minor trend for a long while, especially on the Indian subcontinent, uh, until two powers, basically, uh, the Bactrians and the Kushans. Uh, the Bactrians were Indo-Greek kingdom, and the Kushans were uh, a sort of mixed sort of steppe people that developed a kingdom in uh, northern India. And uh, the Kushans were mostly Zoroastrian, but they, like the Bactrians, sponsored Buddhism along with their own faith and integrated it into their own belief systems as well. So with the help of both of those kingdoms, Buddhism was able to flourish. And actually both of these kingdoms ended up paying and sponsoring for missionary activity that went into China, Southeast Asia, and further. So now those areas have become the strongholds of Buddhism. Yeah, so, one thing that struck me uh, was that Asha seems a lot like Dharma. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the main two influences I like to point to is that uh, it seems like the conception of Dharma may have been influenced by the pre-existing conception of Asha uh, in a theological dialogue by the historical Buddha of sorts, um, but also uh, the idea of the Maitreya, the coming future Buddha is heavily influenced by the idea of Mitra in uh, Persian Zoroastrian mythology and ideas, uh, because Mitra is presented as being a lord of agreements, of contracts, of, uh, of, future, of the future. And so, uh, because what we agree on does not benefit us in the present, it benefits us in the future. And so Mithra is viewed in that sort of sense, uh, and Maitreya is viewed as this future Buddha uh, of the agreements of our Dharma will develop and bring about the coming of the Maitreya. And so it's very likely that there was a sort of messianic component that was brought in from people who saw the worship of Mithra, but were involved mostly in Buddhism at the time. Uh, I guess the, one difference is that Buddhism tends to be more non-theistic, and in, in Zoroastrianism, you have Ahura Mazda. Yeah, uh, I think both tend to have a uh, both tend to have the schools uh, that either lean towards a theistic or a non-theistic component. In Zoroastrianism, you also see what's known as rational Zoroastrianism, um, in which Ahura Mazda, because uh, Ahura Mazda translates as uh, wise lord, but it can also translate as sovereign wisdom. So uh, the rational Zoroastrian components tend to view it in this sort of rationalistic fashion of Ahura Mazda not being a deity, so to speak, but a, something closer to, say, a collective unconscious or the grand sum of the universe. Uh, kind of like a force. Exactly, exactly. May the force I, be with you. Yeah, Asha actually is most comparable in modern pop culture to the Force as a sort of uh, natural state, like the Tao, a natural state that one aligns to and lives of effort effortlessly. Uh, and thus, therefore, one can be empowered by living in accordance to Asha. 
uh, which in itself is not something that can be codified or truly spoken of. Uh, Zarathustra in the Gathas uh, speaks of uh, needing to learn of the esoteric wisdom. So uh, the unspoken truth is the is the best way to say it. And that fits a lot with uh, Taoism in that sort of sense of, uh, you know, the Tao that is the true Tao cannot be spoken. Yeah, and, because it can't be expressed in words, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And Asha is very similar in that sort of way. It's an almost untranslatable term. Um, and so uh, the other religion uh, going back that I would say Zoroastrianism has influenced heavily is Islam. Uh, one of the first companions of Muhammad was a Zoroastrian priest, uh, a Mobed known as uh, Salman al-Farsi, and uh, basically meaning Salman the Persian. And uh, he uh, he helped Muhammad establish the first Muslim communities. Um, and also certain things that were common among Zoroastrians of that day have now become part and parcel of uh, being a Muslim, praying five times a day, uh, usually facing a certain direction. Zoroastrians would face fire or the sun. Uh, Muslims would face Mecca, previously Jerusalem. Um, and the uh you know the ideas of uh cleanliness and purification before prayer uh stuff like that that all tends to uh come from a particular era of zoroastrianism uh during the sasanian empire which was the empire around the time of muhammad's life so is there a priesthood yes 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 so uh zoroastrianism tends to divide itself mostly by culture and region than it does by ideology sometimes, except in uh, North American Zoroastrianism, which tend to sometimes divide itself by ideological component. Um, so, for example, in Iranian uh, society, uh, the priesthood is uh, mostly one can train for the priesthood. Uh, one can become a priest of their own free will. In Parsi, that's Indian Zoroastrian society, uh, the priesthood is inherited. Parsi Zoroastrianism is considered to be uh, highly, not conservative, because there are a lot of elements in it influenced by Hinduism, uh, but uh, I would say more reactionary in the sense. Uh, and Kurdish Zoroastrianism is... Uh, a brand new form of Zoroastrianism, mostly, that is inspired by old Iranic Kurdish forms of Zoroastrianism, and they they have a more loose understanding of the priesthood as well. Well, for the benefit of our listeners, can you do a, you're specializing in comparative religions, it sounds like, can you compare Zoroastrianism with current day uh, relig mainstream religions here in the United States? Of course, yes. Um, so Zoroastrianism, I would say, uh, can be easily compared to a lot of the major mainstream religions here in the United States. Uh, Zoroastrianism probably theologically has most in common with something like Unitarian Universalism, interestingly enough, um, which, while small, also punches above its numbers uh, in influence. Uh, due to the fact that uh, Zoroastrianism embraces a multi-religiosity. Uh, Zoroaster in the Gathas speaks of uh, a call to seek truth wherever one may find it, uh, which uh, has reflected historically in Zoroastrians being syncretists, basically wherever they went. Uh, the United States, despite the current ideological and spiritual battles it may be facing on places like Fox News and so forth, uh, has definitely uh, a very syncretist component to it. When interviewed, most Americans actually share religious beliefs with one another on a frequent level. Um, of an interesting scale, uh, a lot of uh, Christians in the United States uh, do not believe in a hell, actually. Uh, they believe in, in, if they do believe in any sort of divine punishment, they believe in immediate punishment. And that's sort of different from what's being told to us by the media uh, as to what the Christian landscape looks like. In the same way, the Zoroastrian landscape is kind of difficult to pinpoint down. 
because the main emphasis of Zoroastrianism is free will. Uh, so each individual, I joke that if you get a room of Zoroastrians together, 10 of them, you'll get 12 different opinions as to what Zoroastrianism is. And so in this case, uh, you'll get Zoroastrians that do believe in an afterlife, Zoroastrians who don't believe in an afterlife, Zoroastrians who believe in reincarnation, and so forth. Uh, and so that's just one of the examples. In this case, I would say that Zoroastrianism probably has most in common with uh, Dharmic faiths, uh, like Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, but it also tends to interact fairly well with... Uh, Taoism, Shintoism, and so forth. But out of the main mainstream American religions, um, I think due to uh, the love that Zoroastrianism has for ritual, um, I think a Zoroastrian wouldn't feel too out of place stepping into a Catholic mass, so to speak, or an Episcopalian ma uh, mass or service, what have you. Um, but also would theologically be able to uh, discuss matters with, say, uh, a Protestant. Some Zoroastrians are iconoclastic, like some Protestant faiths are. Uh, and in that sense, they share that with uh, Muslims. Other, uh, other Zoroastrians tend to be heavily uh, in love with icons and displays of, uh, of art and whatnot. Um, but I would say, besides the Dharmic faiths of Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and so forth, uh, it would feel most comfortable with Sufism in the United States, with uh, uh, neo-paganism due to a belief in multiple divinities and also a sheer love for nature, uh, and with uh, the vast majority of the of christians in the united states being the dominant religion i think it would have uh aesthetically ritualistically far more in common with catholicism but philosophically far more in common with say something like uh unitarian universalism episcopalianism a, a little bit more liberally minded religions yeah i'm more familiar with buddhism and one thing i know about buddhism is that as it has been adopted in the U.S. and as more and more Buddhists uh, and Buddhist centers and so forth appear in the U.S. or, you know, are here, uh, it changes mm -hmm. somewhat. And I'm wondering if that's happening with Zoroastrianism, too, in the U.S., whether uh, there's an adaptation sort of going on. Oh, yes. Uh, absolutely. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Buddhism in that regard, because in my research, I've recently been doing a lot of research into uh, developments of Buddhism within the African-American community and oh. how it has sort of developed into uh, there's a great book out there that sort of details this called Radical Dharma. And it's a sort of mixing of uh, sort of uh, 1970s, 1960s ideas of social, sexual and racial liberation uh mixed in uh with uh sort of uh different ideas of buddhism mahayana theravada and tantric buddhism and so um it does seem to be adapting in a way that would actually not be too dissimilar to the way buddhism adapted in east asia i mean having just come back from japan i can assure you that japanese buddhism has more in common with other Japanese faiths than it does say with Chinese Buddhism or Vietnamese Buddhism and so forth. And I think that is one of the strengths of a religion like Buddhism in the same way it is one of the strengths of a religion like Zoroastrianism. Historically, wherever Zoroastrianism went, it syncretized and it adapted to the culture. Um, the Sogdians of uh, what would be modern day Xinjiang province where the Uyghurs are right now, um, it used to be a heavily Zoroastrian faith that syncretized also with Taoism and uh, Shaivitism, so the worship of Shiva and whatnot, and Buddhism as well. And uh, if you look into the West, we have actually at Mount Nemrut, I think with modern day Anatolia, uh, there is um, evidence of uh, syncretism in, these, in statue form 
of say Zeus Ahura Mazda, uh, Apollo Mithra, and so on like that. So, and this didn't seem to be much of a problem to Zoroastrians wherever they went. In the same way, modern day in North America, uh, a North American Zoroastrianism is developing that is unique to our region here. Uh, that has more in common with other North Americans than it say it has with uh, the Iranian or say Indian Parsi antecessors. Um, one example of this is that there is a North American Mobeds Council. Mobed is the term for the priesthood uh, that works alongside uh, Fezana, which is the Federation of uh, Zoroastrian Associations of North America. And these are two of the main power structures. But because of the way Zoroastrianism works, and I would say that there is an influence coming in of America's own transcendentalist, individualist sort of uh, spirit core, uh, that has influenced Zoroastrianism further to where the priesthood has almost become an advisory body here uh, that just does rituals and mostly people don't uh, – in the – in Parsi India, uh, priesthood the priesthood tends to have more power, and people tend to rally around priests in their day-to-day -day life. Here in North America, if a priest says something, it's more likely to become a, a discussion topic around the dinner table than it is to become a mandate. And so it is up to the individual Zoroastrian and the Zoroastrian household in North America to form their identity. And so in that sense, Zoroastrians don't gather by culture much here. Uh, they tend to gather by locality and ideology. So for example, in Houston, uh, has one of the largest uh, Zoroastrian communities in North America. There is a Zoroastrian association in Houston with a huge center and an Atashkade, which is a name for the temple Zoroastrians gather at. And you see Zoroastrians of differing cultural backgrounds, ideologies, and so forth gathering in one place. In California, sometimes it is separated by ideology. You'll see uh, traditionalist Zoroastrian centers or uh, the California Zoroastrian Center, uh, which I've been affiliated with in the past, which is more liberally minded and uh, tend to have a very sort of academic and community engaging approach. And so in North America, what we're seeing now is this distinct attempt to break away from say the the old lands, the old world, the old community in a very American, typical fashion, of course, uh, and basically become their own thing, their own Zoroastrianism. And North America is actually, besides Kurdistan, uh, the area of the world in which Zoroastrianism is growing the fastest. There are most more converts here um, from both, say, ethnic related backgrounds, so from the Iranic world or from the Indian world, um, and also non-ethnic converts like myself uh, do, that have been uh, growing here in number more than anywhere else in the world. Earlier, you mentioned there being uh, Zoroastrian priests in, you know, in Iran, and that's a very conservative, re religious conservative uh, nation, as, as are a, a number of the Middle Eastern nations. How is the relationship with the um, well, actually, the morality police that they have there, does that impact your your priests, the, the, are the Zoroastrian priests? Oh, absolutely. Zoroastrians under the Islamic Republic of Iran suffer uh, still under persecution. Uh, there is, however, an element. Uh, so I like to divide religion as being between... Uh, it's not an easy separation. They mix in a lot, but there is state religion and folk religion, uh, the religion of the people versus the religion of the establishment. And uh, while the Islamic Republic may hold uh, particularly negative views or disparaging views towards Zoroastrianism, even though they are technically protected by law, so to speak, um, the f average Iranian, even the average Shia, Iranian uh, holds a very positive view 
of Zoroastrians. A lot of them grow up amongst Zoroastrians. They tend to uh, have a historical view of Zoroastrianism as their ancient faith. They may not believe in it anymore, but they have an almost culturalistic, natural, nationalistic view of Zoroastrianism as something that must be protected because it is the Iranian identity. Um, this does not fit well into the narrative of the Ayatollahs, uh, who seek, of course, to develop an image of Iran as new, as Islamic, and as conservative and traditionalist, uh, which if anyone's been to Iran or even seen an, a travel show to Iran, it becomes very clear that that's not the case on the ground. A lot of Iranians are fairly modern and progressive. And uh, as shown by the current uh, revolution happening in Iran right now, in vast numbers, uh, Iranians are resisting against the Islamic Republic. Recently, one of the... Uh, one of the moments of interchange that happened between Iranians and uh, the, the sort of Islamic Republic and Zoroastrians uh, was sadly two difficult moments. One, a city councilor was elected uh, that was a Zoroastrian, and the the authorities of, uh, say, the Ayatollah and whatnot uh, had him removed until popular discourse caused him to be placed back in power again. Um, and then a a visiting Zoroastrian pri priest was actually found murdered in Iran, and he may have actually been murdered by the state. So there is a bit of difficulty, and a lot of Zoroastrians I talk to, especially amongst the youth who want to travel and see sort of the, what would be considered the spiritual homeland, uh, have a deep fear of doing so while the Islamic Republic is around, just simply because it's an unpredictable force. One day they may be treating Zoroastrians uh, with an utmost level of respect for the sake of propaganda, uh, you know, with the celebrations of traditional Zoroastrian holidays like Nowruz or the birthday and death day of Zoroaster and so forth. Um, but the next day uh, they're conducting arrests and assassinations just simply for believing something different. And it's not just the Russians that suffer under this. I would say uh, the Baha'i suffer greatly uh, under the Islamic Republic. They're not even recognized or protected nominally in the law. And um, Mazdaeans, uh, Mandaeans, and uh, Jews that remain in Iran also suffer as well. And so yeah, even Christians, because uh, there is a fairly sizable Christian community in Iran, it is uh, out of the two faiths that people convert to secretly in Iran, it's uh, Zoroastrianism and Christianity. And Christianity tends to be the larger of the two. So it sounds a bit like the, maybe a mirror image of certain parts of this country, the way they deal with religions that they don't approve of uh, certain religions. So there is a bit of oppression here, maybe not as severe as Iran, but you'll You'll see, you know, strange reactions. You know, people being denied a public office, being denied service in a in a, in a business. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. America likes to claim greatly that we're some grand advanced democracy, but we are still stuck in many ways that would be very comparable to uh, the Islamic Republic. To I think honest. we may be getting over that. <laughs> yeah, actually, we're we're, we're starting to jump over that hurdle for sure. Yeah, and uh, well, one thing I know, I like I well, I know somebody particularly from Egypt who was a Christian in Egypt, and my sense is that there was like some persecution of Christians by Muslims uh, in Egypt, or they certainly had that perception. And I think here in the U.S., you also have Christians who have the perception that they're persecuted or diminished in some way by people who are either of a different faith or, of, you know, people who are agnostic, atheists, who non-Christians, basically. And there seems to be a real sort of backlash here to try to assert that Christianity is the state religion, uh, which is kind of not consistent with the American um, uh, project. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, 
one could even look back all the way back to the founding fathers of this country to see the religious diversity amongst them and also the philosophical diversity um the founding fathers uh, i mean it would surprise so many especially uh during the bush era uh would surprise so many to see folks like jefferson washington franklin and so forth uh discussing their love of islam and uh how they would read from the quran to each other and uh it was uh on i believe it was keith ellison uh, uh one of the congressmen who is a muslim uh who was actually sworn in on thomas jefferson's quran so it is sort of interesting that we are still having these debates <laughs> that our founding fathers would probably not particularly understand um but it is also sadly uh due to reagan and the conservative backlash uh we lost a lot of the uh i would say social cultural and definitely religious advancements we made as a society during the 60s and 70s um and are only starting to regain them back again and we may be on the verge of losing them again oh absolutely just as quickly um i mean i think it, there is an inherent difficulty in um when you have we have many religions and each religion has its interpretation of reality really uh and you know creation reality why we're here what the meaning of life is and the problem is, to me seems to be when one religion assumes that it has the sole valid interpretation. Uh, now, how about Zoroastrianism? Is there that sort of chauvinism within Zoroastrianism or or dogma? Yeah, thank in any in any parts of Zoroastrianism. Thankfully, thankfully, it isn't much of a thing. Uh, I would say that. Uh... It has had its historical moments, like any faith, in which, uh, and it it all it always amounts to the state, or some state or business related movement, hijacking the faith, you know, to uh, weaponizing. Exactly, weaponizing is an excellent term. This happened uh, uh, during the Sasanian Empire, definitely, um, which eventually led to its collapse, and. Uh, I would say uh, it happens mostly in Parsi uh, uh, Zoroastrian communities in India, which are still uh, heavily controlled by ideas of moneyed systems. Uh, they have uh, an association known as the, the Bombay Parsi Punshayat, which basically controls uh, the real estate of uh, modern day Mumbai, uh, because Zoroastrians had a big stake in it, especially during the British Raj. Um, and they get to set the tone of the religion because of the money and power that they have there. However, in Iran, which is particularly progressive, uh, and in the rest, I would say, of the Zoroastrian world, there is none of this exclusivity or posturing that you tend to see from, say, like, evangelical Christianity. Um, most Zoroastrians are very inclined to study other faiths, to study other philosophies, including other politics than their own. Uh, they're inclined to uh, talk with their neighbor, to engage with them. Uh, Zoroastrians tend to view interfaith work as a sacred activity, actually. And um, it's, it's incumbent among Zoroastrians to uh, build peace and understanding and to seek out truth wherever it could be found. And so, honestly, as as shown historically and even today among Zoroastrians, that sometimes can be searching in other religions. And so this leads to what I think is an important element of where we're shaping up as a society. What we're seeing is a battle between exclusivity, especially religiously, exclusivity and multi-religiosity. And so uh, this sort of exclusivity is actually in its dying gasps. Less and less people associate and acknowledge themselves as being of just one 
particular tradition or faith or what have you. Uh, yeah, they're just really loud. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the upper Western world. And uh, and uh, that's the thing. You put it perfectly. They're just really loud. It's the dying gaffes. Uh, I mean, the Christianity that we know today as being the one that seeks to dominate the Supreme Court, this sort of dominionist, angry, loud, hateful Christianity is actually small in number. It's just loud and infiltrationist. It puts people in power of its own belief, but there's not that many of them and they continue to shrink. And that's in particular why they're lashing out more because more and more people who engage religiously or spiritually tend to be more open to one another. And that actually is the movement that's growing the most. Um, you'll see not just uh, this sort of multi-religious approach. At my own university, they, it's become such a huge thing to study in academia that they have a center for multi-religious studies now. And in, uh, in sort of the United States spiritual landscape, we tend to see also the designation of spiritual but not religious also growing greatly. And what spiritual but not religious tends to mean is I will – you know, someone will take inspiration from a variety of religious systems and not affiliate with a single one whatsoever. And uh, so that's why I say that we, we do have this sort of battle. And I think that will play through politically. The situation we see, sort of example, in Russia or in our own electoral landscape um, also fits in that sort of sense. Either we discuss our ideas with one another in a non-hateful progressive and sort of understanding fashion, or we become exclusionists, believe that our side is fully 100% correct and uh, are willing to kill for it, basically. Um, and so that's that's definitely a trend I see developing here. And I'm very thankful that Zoroastrianism is not under trend of exclusionary behavior, but rather of the sort of accepting and engaging front. Well, you're you're an author of role playing games, and one live action role playing game or LARP that I'm kind of familiar with is called QAnon. Yes. And the problem of QAnon is that it has uh, the players of the game seem to have forgot that it's a game. And uh, I wonder, as a as a person who studies multiple religions, uh, do you have insights about Q and how it's evolving? Absolutely. Um, I would say that uh, this whole Q and on phenomenon definitely started as uh, an ARG, which is sort of an augmented or alternate re reality gaming system. And uh, what that means is, uh, I mean, there were previously games like this, like Majestic and so forth, which uh, developed with the idea that you could combine elements of your daily life with uh, the gaming aspect. So Majestic would send you faxes back when everyone had faxes and uh, would send you emails, phone calls, even letters in the mail. Sometimes actual agents would meet you out in public and stuff like that. And, you know, that was a lot of fun for people looking for that for engaging day-to-day -day sort of game aspect. Uh, QAnon definitely took aspects of this and made it into a heavily politicized uh, augmented reality gaming system um, in which people awaited the drops from the mysterious queue, uh, which gave them coded missions and so forth, or coded knowledge, and they formed their own groups to try to unlock the puzzles and so forth, almost like a mixture of an ARG and a treasure hunt, but an information treasure hunt. Um, now, I would say especially especially after the events of January 6th, the loss of Donald Trump in the election, and the general disappearance of Q, um, has made the QAnon movement less of a gamified movement and more of a new religious movement, actually. Um, a lot of the language and the way that QAnon folks engage now is fully along the lines of spirituality and religion. They believe, uh, it, depending, you know, it, it's varying theologies now, but there is a general belief that uh, Donald Trump is a divinely inspired world savior. 
um, that uh, Q was a prophet or a witness of some kind, uh, or may have even been God. Uh, there are the ideas that uh, previously dead politicians uh, will either reincarnate or come back to life like JFK Jr. and whatnot, or JFK himself. And also that uh, the governments that exist are only a mirage uh, hiding the real truth of the deep state, which is controlled by a uh, demonic uh, you know, pedophiles and murderers and rapists who will engage with a super drug uh, drawn on for the adrenaline of children uh, that will allow them to live forever. It 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 seems like something Robert Anton Wilson would write uh, in Illuminatus, and uh, I think that's part of the problem. I remember. Uh, you know, being in Texas, I've engaged heavily with like the Church of the Subgenius. It's a it's a Texas born uh, ranting culture, and uh, I do think um, that uh, there was a recent documentary that had come out about them, and uh, there was an excellent element of where they saw a lot of the things that they just did not take seriously that were part and parcel of being part of the Church of the Subgenius turned around in this whole QAnon and you know, other culture stuff, you know, uh, Church of Subgenius grabs conspiracies and turns them on their head and makes fun of them. Whereas QAnon views those very same fake conspiracies and views them as completely real and that they must exist, they must be true, uh, that there must be no issue with them and that we must fight against them. So what you get is, you know, sadly, the recent shoot up at a gay club by someone who was engaged in that uh, conspiratorial behavior uh, affiliated with QN on stuff. You get the January 6 uh, uprising in Washington, D.C., uh, where mostly QN on folks thought that they were abolishing finally a deep state that was about to murder their children you have the save our children movement which is heavily reminiscent of the satanic panic of the 1980s and early 90s uh that claims that uh people in the media and people in literature and so forth and education were warping their children uh to train them to be slaves and usually sexual slaves or demonic sacrifices or what have you so what we're getting now is sadly the birth and further rapid development of a what i would consider to be a fairly dangerous new religious movement uh that has a decentralized power structure which makes it more potent and more dangerous for sure because unlike say things like the people's temple of jim jones uh when jim jones was gone and that great tragedy happened in guyana uh there the people's temple ceased to exist uh with q being gone and trump uh not having been reelected, q anon has only grown uh and that's because there are no major leaders that uh the community relies fully upon the it's been gamified to such an aspect that they rely on each other like cooperative like a cooperative game of sorts yeah, if you listen to the language of QAnon and similar extreme political organizations, it, it's it's almost identical to the language from the ultra-conservative Christian nationalist people. I mean, you, you, well, their, their, their membership seems to be interchangeable anyway, so it's just disturbing to see someone making a religion out of uh, extreme you know, hate. Oh, yeah. Well, and that also gets to the question of the difference between a cult and a religion. Yes, yes, yes. And I deal, I deal with this question a lot, actually, in new religious movement studies. And uh, what basically, I would say that a lot of academics in my field tend to prefer the term new religious movement. And instead of saying cult, we say dangerous new religious movement, because we're all aware, actually, of new religious movements that are not cultish, but get associated with cults uh, consistently. Uh, some examples of new religious movements uh, that are not cultish are sort of like uh, the Sufi movements 
uh, that developed during the 60s and 70s, uh, the Hindu gurus that would show up and left behind temples, basically. Uh, folks like Ram Das would be considered a new religious movement, but Ram Das is also not considered to be a problematic, violent, or dangerous figure in that sort of sense. Um, so um, that's that's why we tend to discourage people from using the word uh, cult just to uh, put all these new religious movements in one category. What differentiates uh, a new religious movement from a dangerous new religious movement is that they fit those particular cult aesthetics. They tend to be a danger to not just their followers, but to society as a large. Because um, uh, I will use two differing examples of uh, dangerous new religious movements. So Scientology, of course, that uh, we're very aware of uh, a dangerous new religious movement, not just to its followers, but society as large, as has been proven by multiple court cases. Um, and uh, their mass infiltration of the US government that happened not too long ago, actually, historically. And uh, there's also, say, for example, uh, the Hare Krishna movement, which, while not a danger to society at large, uh, members of the Hare Krishna movement have stated that they have uh, suffered under abuse and uh, certain stresses that would be characteristic of one what one would consider a cult. Uh, however, this is where it gets more difficult because not every portion of, say, the Hare Krishna movement operates the same way. However, something like Scientology does operate the same way wherever it is because it is a very centralized organization. Um, but we do have, I would say, when it comes to stuff like QAnon, uh, that can easily be labeled a dangerous new religious movement. Uh, it can be easily labeled uh, popularly a cult. Uh, the problem is that all religions develop as new religious movements. All religions develop as what we would be consider a cult. It's only recently, historically, that cult as a term has gotten a negative connotation. And possibly for the better, mostly considering uh, how the sort of new religious movement landscape has sort of developed, especially in the United States. So um, because if you try to use the word cult, say, in India, where there are a huge number of new religious movements always popping up uh, around one deity or another, one guru or another, one teaching or another, a book or another, um, they would just look at you strangely for using the word cult in that sense uh but in the united states where we have like the family children of god uh you know the people's temple uh so on and so forth we have been raised in our society when an image of a new religious movement is automatically dangerous but in reality uh this country is built fully on new religious movements yeah, uh, there are movements that were originally perhaps considered cults in this country, like the Mormons. They, absolutely. They were treated, but they've been assimilated, it seems. Even the Unification Church of the Moonies, that has, uh, I guess, mellowed a bit. They're not nearly as evident, but they, you know, but they still exist and they still have power in uh, various parts of the world. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, I mentioned the transcendentalists earlier, and in their time period, they were completely new and viewed as, uh, you know, a strange new movement. Uh, the Church of Christ scientists, uh, the Mormons, uh, even uh, movements, if, if we're looking even in just like the past 200 years, there are so many established religions and traditions that exist today uh, that we would look at and think, gosh, I guess that's a religion now. <laughs> but uh, in the grand scheme of history, they're relatively new still. So, something we should have asked kind of at the beginning really is uh, what's the definition of religion? Yes. Uh, now, that's a topic of debate even in the field. <laughs> I mean, no no academic can agree on a single definition of what is a religion. But 
I will say that the definition I tend to agree with is uh, it is a ideology or community that practices a set of beliefs uh, that has a set of beliefs and practices uh, that tend to revolve around some metaphysical idea or another. And by metaphysical, I mean uh, not particularly supernatural because uh, Buddhism can fit this definition of religion fairly easily because uh, metaphysically, when we talk about ideas of reincarnation and Dharma, that fits into metaphysics. Yeah, uh, I used to I used to say that Buddhism was not a religion because it was non-theistic, but I, I came to realize that that was... Uh, it depends on how you define religion, really. Ex exactly, exactly. And that's <laughs> that's why arguments as to whether Buddhism is a religion or not, uh, you'll find in uh, my field that people tend to view that as not a particularly important argument. Um, the, the, the thing is that Buddhism to some Buddhists is a religion. Buddhism to other Buddhists is not a religion. And sometimes to other Buddhists, it may depend on how they feel that day about Buddhism. And so, or who they're explaining it to. Uh, like, for example, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, the recently passed uh, great Buddhist master, uh, would say to our audience, our English speaking audience, that Buddhism is a philosophy, a way of life, et cetera. And then to, uh, at his temple in Vietnam, would say that the Dharma must be practiced as a religion. And the thing is that, uh, he was smart enough to understand that when you speak to a certain audience, you must speak according to their codes and languages and understandings. Um, here, uh, there is this idea of Western Buddhism. It is a Buddhism that has been influenced from everything from the early rushes of Buddhism uh, from the 40s all the way to the 1970s. Um, and has further been influenced even by tech companies, Silicon Valley, uh, California Buddhism, and uh, then also further heavily influenced by Tibetan Buddhism. And so, and Zen Buddhism, like DT Suzuki, and also by types like the Dalai Lama. So what we're seeing here in the West is a Buddhism that defies the definitions of traditional Buddhism in other countries, because you could easily walk into a Buddhist center and uh, people will tell you it's not a religion. It is a religion. It's a philosophy. It's a way of life. It's just what keeps me calm at night. You know, it, people will have different ideas of what it is. And that fits also for different people. Talk to a Christian uh, that isn't just uh, in an evangelical setting where they're sort of told to all follow the party line. And uh, you'll find Christians who will say, this is the way, the truth, the light, you know, <laughs> this isn't a religion. Or they will say, it is my personal relationship with Jesus. It is not a religion. Or there will be the people who will say, it is my religion, it is my faith. Uh, others, especially from my parts of the world, like the Caribbean, they may say, it's my tradition. It's the way of my ancestors. It sounds like you could almost say some businesses and industries might qualify as being called a religion just under those definitions you gave. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the, uh, this is, the church of the oil and gas business in Texas. Oh, uh, uh, without a doubt, without a doubt. And then we see this uh, particularly with tech companies, uh, definitely uh, in the Silicon Valley, and especially with tech company figures like, say, Musk, Zuckerberg, and so forth. Um, there's this great religious studies expert on YouTube, uh, and uh, Dr. Andrew, uh, and he runs a channel called Religion for Breakfast. And it is a highly, I highly recommend it. It is a favorite amongst religious studies academics. And uh, he recently had a video of analyzing tech companies under a religious studies lens and how they do fit into these categories, um, especially in the way that HR groups and sort of uh, HR staff in a lot of these tech companies uh, describe their roles in a spiritual sense. Uh, they claim that they are watching out for uh, 
uh, not just uh, the work needs of their uh, of their employees, but also the spiritual needs of their employees. Uh, they're constantly led on meditation retreats. Uh, they're led on wholeness uh, seminars on uh, how to activate uh, their chakras while working, stuff like that. And so, I mean, this fits a certain landscape, which I, uh, for anyone who's seen Mad Men, uh, this was also shown in the latter few seasons, and I, I particularly love this uh, as a religious studies person, where Don Draper begins engaging with things like Esalen, and uh new age movements and buddhism and so forth uh and this is the sort of area also where the tech companies are being built and developed and so what we're seeing nowadays is these tech companies seeking uh consciously actually not unconsciously to uh provide the spiritual well-being of their employees uh so that they can have a greater monopoly over how their employees interact with the world than say another religion because see religion has always been a threat to established authority uh whether it is in power or not i mean uh i come from a region where catholics were overthrowing other catholics <laughs> and you know because uh say like for example archbishop romero uh who was assassinated by his government who was made up of some Catholics, you know, uh, himself was encouraging people to resist this government. Uh, the current Pope, Pope Francis, uh, worked closely with the junta in Argentina, uh, while uh, Jesuits that were being uh, turned in by collaborative priests were working with the resistance against uh, that government. So um, in the same way, Tech companies and corporations would be smart to do this if they want to sort of control how their employees view them, because the danger could be that they could hear from the pulpit or from their Buddhist uh, master or their teacher or what have you, their guru, that, hey, maybe your work-life balance isn't all that great, and maybe – Zuckerberg isn't the guy you think he is, and maybe you should question authority at your uh, at your workplace. Uh, but if your workplace is providing you with your meditation, your wellness seminars, your visits to uh, retreat centers and everything like that, not only do you think your spiritual needs may be fulfilled if you're an employee, you also don't have the time to seek out spiritual alternatives. Yeah, your work becomes your religion. Exactly. Yeah. Completely. Well, we're we're out of time. Uh, we've gone for a great hour of conversation, and Pablo, I really want to thank you for joining us. Oh, it's, it's been, been a pleasure. Great. Maybe yeah, next time terrific. we can have you on sometime, and uh, we can play a game of is it a religion or is it a business? <laughs> Actually, yeah. my hope is that you'll come back and help us figure out how to turn our Plutopia thing into a religion. <laughs> Well, let, let's get it going. I mean, now is the time <laughs> in this post-pandemic world to build a new religious movement. So. Right on, right on. <laughs> well, thanks so much. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future. <laughs>